Okay, so this time I want to talk about what are probably the most important structures in category theory, which are arrows. And what we're going to talk about today are three very important kinds of arrows and how they relate with each other. So we're going to talk about isomorphisms, monomorphisms and epimorphisms. So these three kind of arrows are really important. Isomorphisms let us tell if two objects are the same. Monomorphisms let us talk about the parts of an object. And epimorphisms let us talk about when some kind of arrow almost kind of covers its target object. So these are really essential ideas and in most categories that you'll study these special kind of arrows have important roles to play and I would say the kind of arrow that I'm especially interested in is monomorphisms because they allow us to talk about the parts of an object, they allow us to do topos theory, they allow us to think about logic in these kind of alien worlds of different categories and so on. So there's lots of very important theoretical relationships between these different kinds of arrows. And so in this video, I'm going to go through how these kinds of arrows are defined and how they relate to each other. And, you know, when, as you learn more and more category theory, you become more inclined to want to talk about everything in terms of category theory. So rather than describing everything in terms of set theory, it becomes more preferable to describe things in category theory. And using these kind of results that I'm going to be going over in these kind of more theoretical videos, we can really gain a kind of toolbox of different important relationships between these fundamental theoretical ideas. So let's start by talking about monomorphisms. Okay, so topos theory is basically category theory where you assume that there's certain special kind of categorical gizmos like subobject classifiers, which allow you to be able to study the properties of subobjects, the properties of monomorphisms. Now, topos theory is very useful for studying particular categories. For example, if you're interested in the category of dynamical systems, that's a topos. And you can use a lot of the results from topos theory to basically apply your set theory intuition um, to talk about what's going on in dynamical systems in a very kind of succinct way. So that's good. But that's just one application of topos theory. Another one is topos theory is a kind of language in which we can formalize mathematics. Because basically, using the kind of interactions between things like the subobject classifier and exponential objects and limits and so on you can essentially talk about most of mathematics. So normally when we do mathematics, we start with sets. So we essentially start with this topos of sets and use it to um, construct all these different things. But with topos theory, we find that we don't have to start with the category of sets. In fact, it's usually okay to start with pretty much any topos. Maybe you want a topos that has a natural number object, but if you start with a topos, because you have this idea of logic and so on, you can construct data structures that look like pretty much most things you'd be interested in doing. Um, now that second approach I find extremely interesting for many reasons. I mean, um, although you can do these constructions in different toposes, different toposes do have different kinds of properties. 
and so it gives one a kind of insight into the kind of structure of these different sorts of universes where we could do mathematics. It's very interesting. However, in order to take that approach, one really wants to be quite formal about things. I mean, um, the whole idea of taking that second approach is really to sort of brush set theory under the carpet, to think about what's going on in mathematics in terms of arrows and objects. And so there are many kinds of mathematical results which you want to know. It becomes very important then to build up a kind of understanding of how topos theory works in a sort of formal way. You know, what are the theorems? What are the proofs, etc. So, <clears throat> so having said that, I have done a video introducing topos theory. Um, but now what I want to do is to revisit topos theory in a more kind of gradual and systematic way and really build up enough results so that we can talk about mathematics in general, um, not starting from sets, but starting from a topos. So what I want to do is to review some of the most important ideas about subobjects. Okay, so these are essentially the idea of parts in categories. Now, our basic idea of what a subobject is is that it's a monic. Okay, so a subobject of B is a monic into B. A monic is just another word for a monomorphism. So the definition is that an arrow M from A to B is monic if and only if for any pair of arrows X and Y from any object H into A, we have that if M after X equals M after Y, then X equals Y. Okay, so that's our definition of a monic. And here are some examples of monics in different categories, okay? And hopefully you can see that in each case, this monic is selecting a kind of part of this target object here. So here's an example in the category of sets. Here, a monic is just a one-to-one -one function. And you see it's picking out this kind of subset here. So in this sense, you would say that this monic is representing this subobject because in the category of sets, the objects are sets. This subobject here is a subset and it's sort of been selected by this monic. Okay, so in this case, here's another example of a monic. In this case, we're dealing with this category of graphs, okay? And so we have this graph structure here. Um, we select a sort of subgraph of it, like so. And we see that this is being pointed out by this monic. Okay, so in these categories of functors from some category C into set, an arrow is going to be monic precisely when it's a uh, one-to-one -one function on each of its components, okay? So, for example, a graph homomorphism involves a mapping from the edge set of this graph to the edge set of this graph and the vertex set of this graph to the vertex set of this graph. So basically, such a arrow in this category of graphs consists of a function that's mapping the vertices and a function that's mapping the edges with special properties that they have to satisfy. But the thing is that given such an arrow, given such a pair of functions, they're going to be monic precisely when each of those functions is a one-to-one -one function. Uh, if we have one of these categories 
um, of functors from some category C to set, well, the arrows in such a category are going to be natural transformations between functors. And such an arrow will be monic, it will be a monomorphism, okay, remember, monic is just a, another word for monomorphism, okay, so it'll be monic precisely when each of the components of that natural transformation are one-to-one -one functions, okay, so it's fairly easy to identify what the monics are in, um, in this category. Well, let's carry on. What about in the category of dynamical systems? What's a monic there? Well, if it's really the idea of a part of an object, then it ought to be a kind of dynamical system contained in a dynamical system. Indeed it is. It's basically something that picks out a sort of sub-dynamical system. Okay? Um, but also you can think of it as just an arrow from one dynamical system to another that doesn't sort of send two states on top of each other, much as this is a graph homomorphism that doesn't send vertices on top of each other and doesn't send edges on top of each other. And a final example, um, it's possible to form these kind of categories of differentiable objects uh, with smooth maps between them. So I'm not really going to define this properly at the moment, but there's sometimes uh, here's a category like that, which we'll call spaces. And one thing you can do in such a category is basically have all these smooth spaces. So you could, for example, take Euclidean three-dimensional space and then if you have a sphere, that sphere is a kind of, kind of part of this block of space. And you can say that it's a sub-object of it. Okay, so we see that this idea of monics can be applied all over the place. But how are we to think about what a monic is? Well, in my opinion, um, I think the best way to think about a monic is basically using this kind of definition. Because what is a monic in the category of sets? Well, basically, it's a way of selecting a subset. I mean, in a sense, it pretty much is a subset, okay? Um, yes, we could select this subset by using different monics. For example, maybe there's another set down here and we could select it like this. But I mean, these two um, sources of these arrows are isomorphic. And essentially, these are sort of equivalent subobjects, okay? These are sort of equivalent monomorphisms, okay? So really, the important thing about a monic is that it's selecting a sort of sub-object for you. Now I'll make this more precise later, but let's just run with this kind of intuition, okay? If we think about a monic as selecting a sort of sub-object, well in this case it would be selecting some of the elements of our set, in this case it would be selecting some of the vertices and edges of our graph, in this case, it would be selecting some of the states of our dynamical system to form a sort of smaller dynamical system. In this case, it would be basically selecting some of the parts of these kind of continuous objects. Um, and so the basic idea then is that a sub-object or equivalently a monic is selecting some of the stuff that's in an object. But what kind of stuff is in a general object, in a general category? I mean, isn't the whole idea that we don't really know exactly what these objects represent in an arbitrary category? Isn't the idea that we allow ourselves freedom and we're not going to sort of 
um, constrain ourselves by saying these objects um, represent particular things or have particular elements and so on. And yes, that is the idea, but there's something very important about an object, and that is the arrows into it. Okay, so remember, in the category of sets, these elements in a set are just arrows into that set from the terminal object. So this is picking out this element, for example, here the singleton set is the terminal object. These edges of this graph are just arrows in this category of graphs from this graph with a single edge. The states of this dynamical system here just correspond to arrows from this kind of infinite dynamical system, um, which is sort of like the natural numbers, state zero goes to state one, state one goes to state two and so on. And arrows from this into our dynamical system. are in one-to-one -one correspondence with these states of our dynamical system. So we see that the bits and pieces in these cases, and I'm not going to talk too much about this one today, but the bits and pieces basically correspond to arrows into that object. So then maybe we can think about the essential form of an object in a category as being defined by the arrows that go into it, all the arrows. Okay, so this is quite a um, bewildering idea in some sense. For example, think about a set in the category of sets. We're used to thinking of that being defined by all the kind of elements in it, or the arrows into it from the terminal objects. But now I'm saying, why don't we think about all of the arrows that are going into that object? So that would be, you know, every single function which has a target as that object, which is quite a immense amount of uh, stuff going on there. But hopefully thinking along those lines helps you to see what an important definition this is. Because what this really does is it tells you which arrows are going to be in a particular sub-object. So if the kind of form of an object is specified by the arrows going into it, then the form of a sub-object should also be sort of specified by what the arrows are that are going into it. Okay, but what do we consider to be an arrow in a sub-object? Well, here's the important definition, okay? So let's say we have this sub-object M of B, okay? So this is some monic from some A to B. So this is a sub-object of B. And now let's say we have an arrow F, which is an arrow from X to B. Now, the important definition is that we say that F is in M. OK, so this symbol means in. We say that F is in M if and only if there exists an arrow K such that F is equal to M after K. So I think that this is a really important definition. So for example, okay, consider this, like let's say that this is M, and let's say that this is F. Okay, so you see that this function here takes all of its, has all of its values within this particular subset here. 
And so that means that this F is in M. Or if we like, it means that we can think about this F as something that's really going in to this sub-object here. So for the moment, um, so when I say sub-object, you can really think of a sub-object of B as just a monic that goes into B, okay? So anyway, when we say that this F is in M, what we mean is that we can do this function like this, this K here, such that M after K equals F. Now, one thing that's of interest here is in this kind of case, how many arrows K will we have, which make this kind of diagram commute, okay? And the answer is just one. Why? Well, let's suppose that there was another arrow, let's say K dash, which was also such that F equals M after K dash. Well, then we'd have that F equals MK equals MK dash. But then because M is a monomorphism um, by this basic property, that would imply that K equals K dash. So when we have that there's an arrow which is in a monic, that precisely means that there's just going to be one of these kind of arrows k, such that doing the monic after k gives us our original arrow. So here's just another kind of interesting little aside. Think about the identity arrow of b. Is this monic? Yes, it is. I'll leave it to you as a exercise to prove that. But what's interesting then is we can say, well, okay, if this is monic, this is a subobject of B, what are the arrows which are in it? Well, let's pick any arrow F from X to B. Now, is it true that F is in this identity arrow of B? I'm writing the identity arrow of B as one subscript B today. I'm not writing this IDB stuff anymore. But anyway, is it true that F is in 1B? And to find out if this is true, we want to find out if there's an arrow from X to B such that doing this after this arrow gives us F. Well, is it true? Yes, using the arrow F will suffice. And so we have that this is a very big sub-object of B really, because any arrow at all which goes into B is going to be in this sub-object. So we often call this the maximal sub-object. And so we have this notion of now being able to say when a particular arrow is in a particular sub-object. And what we're going to see is that we can really characterize sub-objects like this, just like we can characterize subsets by saying which elements are in them and which elements are not in them. We can characterize sub-objects in general by saying which arrows are in them and which arrows are not in them. And I really love this because it really gives a sort of concreteness to the whole idea of topos theory. Because I think it's the elements in sets that make set theory so concrete. The fact that we're able to say whether a particular element is in a set or it's not in a set and in sort of category theory in these monomorphisms we're able to say if a particular arrow is in it or not 
So we're going to get to that. I should also point out that I sometimes talk about topos theory because that's the main kind of theory that I've got in the back of my mind as the application of this stuff. I mean, each of these categories and the smooth space is one that was here. They're all examples of topotes, but this discussion I'm making about monomorphisms applies to any category at all, okay? Doesn't have to be a topos in order for this kind of reasoning to work. Okay, so this type of notation, this kind of in notation, is normally used when M is a monic and F is just some arrow. Now we could use this notation when F itself is also a monic. Okay, so in this kind of case, remember these kind of flight tails on the arrows to note that these arrows are monics. Okay, but in that kind of case, we tend to write something different instead. We tend to write that F is contained in M. And so we can think of this as the definition of when one monic is contained in another, simply when it's in the second monic, okay? So in this case, um, where we have this monic M and this other monic F, when F is in M, it just means exactly the same thing. It means there exists this arrow K such that MK equals F. But there are some fairly special things that happen in this case here where F is also monic. So remember that when we have F is in M, that means we have this kind of arrow K, which is sort of loading in the source of F into the kind of source of our monic. And it turns out that in this case where F and M are both monics, it turns out that this K here also has to be monic. So how can we see that? Well, what we want to do is to prove that this K here is a monic. So let's suppose that there is a pair of parallel arrows, X and Y, from some object, capital Y, into this object, capital X. Now we want to show that K is monic. So let's suppose that K after X equals K after Y. Now, we want to prove that K is monic, so we want to show that this implies that X equals Y. So how do we do it? Well, the idea is simply that if we just compose these stuff with M, then we have that MKX equals MKY. But what's MK? What's M after K? It is F. And F is monic. So we could equivalently write this as Fx equals Fy. Now we know that F is monic, so we get that X equals Y. So we have that if Kx equals Ky, then we can infer that X equals Y. So that means that K is monic. So what does this kind of situation then look like in the category of sets? Well, it'll probably look something like this. We have this set B, and then A would be a subset of it. And then because there's this monic K, X will be a subset of A. So we have some kind of a situation like this. So what I want to do is to build up this kind of intuition that we can 
identify what a monarch is by knowing what arrows are in it. And in order to be able to talk about this kind of thing, we need to really know what it what a monarch is. And in particular, we want to know when two monarchs are equivalent. OK, so what's it mean for two monarchs to be equivalent? Well, basically, it means that they're essentially the same. I mean, think about. So think about this situation, for example, we've got these two monarchs, but they're both really selecting this subset here of our set. And the only real difference between these monarchs is their source sets, but their source sets aren't that different. I mean, they're basically isomorphic to each other. The only real difference is what we're calling the elements. And we tend to sort of abstract away details like that in category theory. So we regard these two monics, these two sub-objects of this object here as equivalent. And this is the formal definition of when two monics, M and M dash, that both go into B, are equivalent. Okay? So we say that these two sub-objects, M and M dash of B, are equivalent precisely when we have that M is contained in M dash and M dash is contained in M. So when we say that M is contained in M dash, we just mean that there's this L here such that M is equal to M dash after L. And this L has to be a monic by the argument I gave before. And similarly, when we say that M dash is contained in M, we're basically just saying that there exists this K such that M after K equals M dash. So basically, when we say that these two sub-objects, M and M dash, are equivalent, all we're really saying is there exists an L and there exists a K that make these equations hold true, that M is equal to M dash after L, that's here, and M dash is equal to M after K. So just like in this situation, we could do this here, and what we'd find is if we construct this K and L, they're actually going to form an isomorphism between these sort of source objects of these monics here. And this is true in general. OK, so in general, then, um, when we have this kind of situation where M and M dash are these equivalent monics going into B, we have that the source objects of those monics are going to be isomorphic and these are isomorphisms between them so we can see this quite quickly okay so we have these two equations so now let's just write m and notice that m is equal to m after k after l how can we see this well we know that m is equal to m dash after l and then we can substitute in that M dash is equal to MK. So we get that M is equal to MKL. And now the important thing to realize is that M here is a monomorphism. It's monic, okay? So we can apply this definition. You see, we can rewrite M as M after the identity arrow of A. And what we can do now is just sort of cancel the M's because that's what having a monic allows us to do. And we get that the identity of A is equal to KL. And in a similar way, we get that the identity of A dash is equal to L after K. So these arrows are really forming a sort of 
isomorphism between the sources of these objects involved in these monomorphisms into M um, in such a way that they kind of commute with the arrows which are loading in these source objects into B. But anyway, now that we have this notion of equivalence, and in such a case where M and M dash are equivalent, we might write this as M triple equals M dash. Okay, that's notation some authors use to say that two monics are equivalents. And notice that this is happening precisely when M is contained in M dash and M dash is contained in M. Now, once we understand a bit more about what this means, you'll see that basically this statement of equivalence is basically just saying that any arrow into B is going to be in M if and only if it's in M dash. So basically what I'm saying is just like in sets, we say that two sets are equivalent if and only if they have exactly the same elements. In this case for monics, two monics are equivalent if and only if the, exactly the same arrows are in each of them. Okay, so I really like to think about what a sub-object is by thinking about which kind of arrows are in it, because this really gives a strong parallel with the idea of sets where we can characterize a set by what elements are in it. And so over here, um, I have this kind of definition of when two monomorphisms are going to be equivalent to each other. Um, but what we want to do is to really rephrase this kind of statement in terms of the arrows which are in these monomorphisms. And the key to doing this is to come up with a kind of arrow-centric way of describing this kind of condition, this condition that happens when one monic is contained in another monic. Now recall that the um, real definition of when we write this kind of thing, or let's say when we write this kind of thing, that this monic F is contained in this monic M, we say this is the case precisely when there exists a K such that F is equal to M after K. Um, and the key thing we're going to do is find a way to re-express this just in terms of the arrows which are in F and the arrows which are in M. And this is really the key theorem here. It says that whenever we have a couple of monics, F and M, that go into this object B, we're going to have that F is contained in M if and only if for every arrow H into B, we have that H is in F implies H is in M. So you can put this in parallels with what's going on in set theory. Okay, so if you think, just imagine instead that these were subsets, then you'd say that F is a subset of B, you'd say that F is a subset of M, precisely when every element of F is also an element of M, okay? So this is really a very similar kind of idea. It's just that now we're talking about sub-objects instead of subsets, and we're not so much interested in whether elements are in these things. Now we're interested in whether arrows are in these sub-objects, okay? So it's quite illuminating to see the proof of this. So let's see the proof of this result. So we want to show that this statement on the left implies this statement on the right and vice versa. So let's start by showing that this statement on the right here implies this statement on the left. Okay, so we'll assume this statement on the right is true and we want to somehow obtain that this monic F is contained in this monic M. So how are we going to do that? Well, 
this is actually quite a common trick that we're going to use. Um, we have this sort of statement that holds for all these different arrows, H, uh, which go into B. So we're going to pick a kind of special one. We're going to use this kind of statement here when H is equal to F, okay? Because this little F here is an arrow into B. And so if we're assuming that this statement holds, then it should hold when H is equal to F. Um, so is it true then that F is contained in F? Well, yes, it is true, uh, because if we have another copy of F here, let's say, then we can find an arrow, just the identity of X, such that F after this arrow equals F. So yes, it is true that F is in F. And now we can use this result for the case when H equals F. So we have that when F is in F, that implies that F is in M, okay? So now we have that F is in M. But F and M are both monics and remember, when F and M are both monics, and we have that F is in M, that's really our definition of when we say that F is contained in M. So when we use this kind of contained symbol, it's really just a special case of using this kind of in symbol when both the arrows involved are monic, okay? Um, so indeed we have that F is contained in M. So we've shown now that this statement on the right implies this statement on the left. So, okay, what we'd like to do now is to go the other way. We want to, we want to suppose that this is the case, that F is contained in M, and we want to imply this result on the right. So firstly, what does it mean for F to be contained in M? Well, what it means is that there is a monic, like this, an arrow, so what it means is that there's this arrow k such that f is equal to m after k. That's what F contained in M means. So we can assume that now. And now we want to prove this result. So let's suppose we have some arrow H into B. Let's draw it in. So there's our arrow H into B. Now what we want to do is we want to prove that if H is in F, then H is in M. So how are we going to do it? Well, let's suppose that H is in F. So in other words, we're going to assume that there's an arrow L here, such that H is equal to F after L. Well, that's fine, but remember we're also supposing that F is contained in M. So we also have that F is equal to M after K. So we can substitute this into here and we get that H is equal to M after K after L. And so now, we have this arrow, K after L, and we can say that H is equal to M after K after L. And that means that H is in M. And that's just what we wanted. Okay, so we see the proof works both ways. Now this is a very profound result because now we know 
that saying one monic is contained in another monic, all that means, precisely, you know, equivalently, is that every arrow in that first monic is an arrow in that second monic. So now we have that this result is saying that two monics are equivalent when M is contained in M dash and M dash is contained in M. So in other words, what we have is that this monic M is equivalent to this monic M dash when for every arrow X with the same targets as M and M dash, we have that X is going to be in M if and only if X is in M dash. So then this, you know, this stuff on the right here, this is our kind of equivalent way of saying that this this is kind of our arrow membership centric way of saying that these two sub objects M and M dash are equivalent to just say that they have the same arrows in them. Just like if we have, if we want to say that two sets are equal, we'd like to say that they have the same elements. Okay. So since monomorphisms are so important, I thought it's probably worth proving that they work as we expect them to in the category of sets. So basically, I claim that a monomorphism um, is just a one-to-one -one function when we're working in the category of sets, okay? So I wanted to prove that. So on the left, I've got the definition of a monomorphism, also known as a monic. And on the right, I've got the definition of a one-to-one -one function. Now I'm getting a bit kind of categorical about the way I'm talking about this. I'm talking about the elements of A here as these arrows like U and V from this terminal object one. But this is just a singleton set and these arrows from it, U and V, etc., are just sort of picking out particular elements. So we can think of these really as elements of this set A. And we say that this function f here, or this arrow f, is one-to-one -one on points, or equivalently, we say it's a one-to-one -one function, when f after u equals f after v implies u equals v for any pair of points u and v of a. Um, and here a point of an object is an arrow into that object from the terminal object. So in this category of sets, which we are restricting ourselves to um, a point of an object is nothing more than an element of that set. Now I want to say again, this argument is only valid. I'm only, so I want to say again, this argument is not valid in general. I'm assuming we're working in the category of sets. Okay. So that's what a one-to-one -one function is basically when doing F on a couple of inputs gives the same output that implies that the inputs are the same. That's what it means for a function f to be one to one. And this is what it means for the function. And this is what it means for an arrow f from a to b to be monic. Okay, so how can we see that in the category of sets, these two ideas are equivalent? Well, I think it's fairly clear that since this statement of f bin monic on the left has to hold for any object h and any arrows x and y from h to a. If we consider the special case of this where h is the terminal object we get this kind of definition. Okay so pretty clearly saying f is monic implies that f is one to one on points because this is really saying because this is really saying that F is sort of one-to-one -one when it's composed with arrows coming from any object. Whereas this is just saying F is one-to-one -one when it's composed with arrows from a terminal object. So it's pretty clear that this implies this. 
well, how do we go the other way around? How do we show that in the category of sets, if F is one to one on points, then F is monic? Well, we can argue like this. If F is one to one on points, um, then we're gonna suppose that F after X equals F after Y for these two arrows, X and Y into A from some object H. And what we want to do, of course, is to then somehow infer that x equals y, okay? So how do we do it? Well, what we do is we can consider any point of h. So there's a point of h, an arrow into h from the terminal object. And um, the thing is that since f after x equals f after y, that means that this function f after x is equal to the function f after y, and that means that these functions work the same when we operate them on any points of h. And so if we get any point of h and do f after x, we get the same point of b as if we do f after y on that point. So in other words, we have f after x after alpha equals f after y after alpha. But now what we note, because remember we're assuming that f is one to one on points, we note that x after alpha is a point of a and y after alpha is also a point of a. So we have these two points of a. We have this point x after alpha, which we may call u, and we have this point y after alpha, which we may call v. And we now have that f after u is equal to f after v for these two points. And now we can use this part of our definition, that f, and now we can use this part of our assumptions, that f is one-to-one -one on points, and we know that whenever we have a couple of points of a and we have f of u equals f of v then we must have u equals v so that implies for us then that u equals v in other words it implies that x after alpha equals y after alpha and here is where we use the special properties of this category set so now what we've shown basically is that x and y work the same way upon any points of their source, of any point of h. Now, in general, just knowing that is not enough information to know that x and y are going to be the same arrows, right? So think about, for example, the category of graphs. In the category of graphs, the points are these kind of self-loops. Um, so we could have a graph like this, let's say. Now, if you have a couple of um, graph homomorphisms coming out of that, let's say um, x and y, uh, and you know that they both work the same way on points, that doesn't mean they're the same graph homomorphism, right? Because there's more to this structure than just points. However, in the category of sets, there's only points. A set is just a load of points. Everything in the set can be considered to be an arrow into that set from the terminal object. And so knowing that x after alpha equals y after alpha for any point alpha of h implies that x equals y. And so we have our proof that we have a monomorphism. We now know that this implies this. Okay then, so I want to talk about more special kinds of arrows. So one special kind of arrow, which we're getting quite familiar with, is an isomorphism. And one thing I would like to convince you of is that every isomorphism is a monomorphism. Okay, so we're talking about these special kind of arrows in categories, and one of the most special kind of arrows is an isomorphism. 
I'm just calling it an ISO in at the moment because it's an abbreviation, okay? And one claim I have is that every isomorphism is a monomorphism, okay? So we see this kind of idea work a lot in the category of sets, okay? When we are putting two sets in one-to-one -one correspondence, the kind of function that does that is one of these one-to-one -one mappings has to be a one-to-one -one onto mapping. That's what it means to do a sort of what's called a bijection between two sets to put the elements in one-to-one -one correspondence with each other. Okay, and so we have this kind of result in general that if an arrow f from a to b is an isomorphism, then f is a monomorphism. And it's quite easy to see why. So if we have an isomorphism f from a to b, then what does that mean? Well, what that means basically is that there is an inverse, which we might call f to the minus one. And it has the property that doing this arrow after this arrow gives the identity of a, and doing this arrow after this arrow gives the identity of b. Okay, so then how can we show that such an isomorphism f is always a monomorphism. Well, what we want to do is to show that f satisfies this standard condition for it being a monomorphism. That is, if x and y are two parallel arrows into the source of f, then we have that f after x equals f after y implies x equals y. So how can we get that? Well, we just start by writing f after x equals f after y, and then we think, well, now we know that f is an isomorphism, um, can we use that to convert this equation into this equation? And we can do that if we just compose on the left-hand side with the inverse of f, because if we do that, we get f to the minus one after f after x, equals f to the minus 1 after f after y, and f to the minus 1 after f is just the identity. So essentially these cancel out, and these cancel out, they just become identities that we can ignore in the equation, and we just get that x equals y. So yes, this isomorphism f is a monomorphism, because f after x equals f after y implies x equals y. OK, then, so I'm going to come back to the idea of monomorphisms again, because there's a lot of very nice results about them. Um, but what I'd like to introduce now is the kind of dual idea. The dual idea to that of a monomorphism is a so-called epimorphism. So let's think again about the category of sets and the um, kind of, in a sense, the most special kind of functions um, in the category of sets are isomorphisms. They are one-to-one -one onto mappings. Now, on one side of that is the idea of a monomorphism. That's just a one-to-one -one mapping. But on the other side of that idea is the notion of onto mappings. They are basically mappings that sort of cover the target set. They send something to every element of the target set. And the notion of epimorphism is essentially the kind of generalization of that concept. Hmm. Now, there is a little bit um, it's a little bit misleading to say that actually. Let me just say that in the category of sets, epimorphisms are exactly onto mappings. Okay. In the category of sets, an arrow is an epimorphism if and only if it corresponds to a onto mapping. But perhaps it's a little bit misleading to say that an epimorphism is just a sort of generalization of an onto mapping because 
there's actually another concept which is called a split epimorphism which corresponds to the notion of a onto mapping more kind of directly um, for a general category it just happens that in the category of sets epimorphisms and these so-called split epimorphisms turn out to be exactly the same okay I, I know that's a little bit complicated but let's not get too distracted with this essentially I'm just trying to convince you that in the category of sets this idea of onto mappings these mappings that send something to everything in the target set these are precisely the epimorphisms so what's the full definition of an epimorphism well here it is okay we sometimes say epic for short instead of epimorphism but these mean the same thing so an arrow f from a to b in a general category is called epic or it's called an epimorphism if and only if for any pair of arrows x and y which come out of b here this target object of f and go into some other object h we have that x after f equals y after f implies x equals y so if you write this down alongside the notion of a monomorphism you'll see that these two ideas are basically dual to each other um, and so I claim that in the category of sets a function is going to be an epimorphism if and only if it's a onto function okay so I'm going to try and prove that now let me start by showing that if we have a function f from a to b and it is a onto mapping in the sense that f sends an element of a to each element of b then it's going to be an epimorphism in the category of sets okay um, so what do I need to show well if I'm using this definition I want to show that x after f equals y after f implies x equals y um, for any arrows x and y from b to some other set h okay but it's actually easier for me to show the contrapositive of this which is that if x is not equal to y then that implies that x after f is not equal to y after f so that is a kind of equivalent uh, statement to saying this okay just a contrapositive so that's what I'm going to try and infer so let's suppose that x is not equal to y okay so we're supposing that we have a couple of functions I won't draw them on elements but we have a couple of functions x and y out of b into some h and we're supposing that they're not equal okay and we want to infer that x after f does not equal y after f that these compositions are different functions so how can we do that well we'll assume that x is not equal to y now since we're working in the category of sets that means that means there must be some element of b that x and y disagree on okay so it has to exist some element b such that x of b does not equal y of b So we have this b that x and y disagree on now because we're assuming that f sends something in a to everything in b then this disagreeable element of b here must have something of a sent to it okay so there has to exist some a such that f of a equals b and so now we have that like just substitute it so now if we just substitute this equation into this inequality here we get that x after f after a does not equal y after f after a so 
x after f does not equal y after f. Okay, and so this then implies that f is an epimorphism because saying that x does not equal y implies xf does not equal yf is equivalent to saying that x after f equals y after f implies x equals y. Okay, so this thing in this last green bracket here says that f is an epimorphism. Okay, so we were sort of halfway there. What I'm trying to do is convince you that if we're just working in the category of sets, then an arrow f is going to be an epimorphism if and only if it is an onto mapping on the elements. Okay, so we've shown now that if f is onto on the elements, then f is epic in the category of sets. I must keep saying this is an argument that doesn't sort of generalize over lots of categories. But anyway, let's now finish the proof. Let's show that if f is not onto, then f is not epic. Okay, so let's now suppose that f is not an onto mapping. In particular, let's suppose that there exists some little b in our set capital B that has no element of A sent to it. And now we want to show that this F here is not an epimorphism. So the way we can do this is by cooking up some X and Y that are parallel arrows out of this set B, which um, for which this kind of condition fails. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, ideally what we want is to make a distinct X and Y coming out of B that have the property that X after F equals X after. So what we really want is to make a distinct couple of arrows X and Y coming out of B which have the property that x after f equals y after f. So let's do that. How about if we take our h here to be a two element set, and let's let x, so that's what x looks like, Now we're going to have y, so that y looks the same on the elements that have something in A sent to them. So here's y, but we also will have y acting differently on this kind of rogue element B here. So instead, whereas x sent this element B up to the top, we're going to send it to the bottom. And now notice that what we have is that we have that x does not equal y, but we also have that x after f does equal y after f. So we have this x after f equals y after f, but it doesn't imply that x equals y because that's not what we have. These x and y are different, okay? So in this case, so in this case, f is not epic. So the conclusion then is that in the category of sets, when this fails, when there's something in B that has nothing in A sent to it, then it's not true that F is epic. And also when this is correct, when everything in B has something sent to it, then it is true that F is epic. So, so we have then that in the category of sets, 
this idea of an arrow being an onto mapping is equivalent to the idea of this arrow being an epimorphism. But in general, that's not the case. Okay, so one has to be quite careful um, with making kind of, um, with sort of generalizing ideas from set theory because it's not always obvious um, that you can take these ideas from set theory and just always apply them to other categories. So, um, for example, okay, we've seen that the idea of an onto mapping is basically generalized into general categories to the idea of a monomorphism, okay? And I've tried to argue here that, so we've seen in, so we've seen that the idea of a one-to-one -one mapping is kind of generalized um, into a general category to become the idea of a monomorphism. And this kind of argument suggests, perhaps, um, it suggests that the idea of an onto mapping um, is kind of generalized over general categories to become the idea of a epimorphism. Okay, that's maybe slightly misleading. I mean, um, the argument I've said is correct, but I'll have more to say to kind of, so I don't give you false intuition with this, because actually epimorphisms are a little bit they're not exactly, they're not always really a generalization of the idea of a onto mapping. I mean, they happen to be in the category of sets, but anyway. Um, so the way that this can um, give you a bit of sort of false intuition is you could then think, well, okay, in the category of sets, if an arrow is a one-to-one -one mapping and onto mapping, then it's an isomorphism, right? So um, isn't it true then in a general category that if something is a monomorphism and an epimorphism, then it's an isomorphism? No, that is not correct in a general category. There are many important categories where that holds true, like that holds true in the category of sets, that holds true in any topos, but there are also lots of important categories where you can have arrows which are epimorphisms and monomorphisms, but not isomorphisms. Okay, so one has to be careful with making these kind of generalizations. Okay, um, it's a bit of a, um, it's a bit misleading to say that an epimorphism F from A to B is a kind of arrow which in some sense covers B. I mean, um, this is the case in the category of sets, but there are other categories where this is not exactly so. It's sort of more correct to say that an epimorphism F from A to B in a general category is something that sort of covers so much of the object B that for any distinct arrows, x and y which come out of b we have that the composition of these arrows with f have to disagree the difference between a sort of pair of distinct arrows x and y is going to be detected um, because f covers so much of this object b Okay, so to just try and get a bit of real world intuition related to this concept, um, think about some kind of a haulage company that's going to send some fruit in a lorry, okay? So they have all this fruit, say apples, and they put these apples in different boxes, okay? Um, now, if they put an, at least one apple in every box, Let's say they do that, okay? They put at least one apple in every box in this lorry. And then some, at some point uh, on this journey, um, some of these boxes get lost. So then we can think there's a couple of functions from this set of boxes to true or false, okay? One function would be the kind of um, idealized case that the deliverers had, 
which would be that all of the boxes would get delivered. Okay, so that function, let's say x, sends all of the boxes to true. And then the other case would be, you know, the reality, which is that some of the boxes did get delivered, but also some of the boxes got lost. So that would be another function y from the set of boxes to true or false. Okay, so it would be false that some of the boxes got delivered, some of the boxes got lost. Now, since the people put some fruit in every box, um, someone who was looking at this situation from the perspective of the fruit, as in someone who was composing X after F and Y after F, would notice that some of the fruit had been lost. They would notice that what happened to the fruit in this kind of idealized case was not the same as what happened to the fruit in the reality because there was at least one piece of fruit in every box and some of the boxes were being lost, okay? So in that sense, we can see that because you put fruit in every single box, because you sort of covered this, um, because you sort of covered this set B uh, in the sense that you sent something to each of its elements, um, we have that, if different things happen to the boxes, then different things happen to the fruits, okay? In other words, if, in other words, if X does not equal Y, then X after F does not equal Y after F. Because F covers so much of this object B, that then, because F covers so much of this object B, that, we can detect the effect of distinct arrows X and Y parallel out of B when we consider the compositions X after F and Y after F. Okay, so I want to say some more things about these special arrows and also about the idea of generalized elements, because that's a concept that really helps us to organize our thinking about all these different kinds of arrows which appear in category theory. Now, um, firstly, I should just say, just like an arrow being an ISO implies that arrow is a monic, there's a kind of dual result, which is that if an arrow is an ISO, that implies it is an epic, okay? Now, let me get on to this discussion of generalized elements. So say we have some object B, what is a generalized element of B? Simply, it is just an arrow into B, that's all. So this is pretty simple stuff. I mean, um, if you think about the category of sets, the elements can be considered to be arrows into that object from a terminal object, so they're what we'd normally call elements. But a generalized element in a category is just any arrow into our object of interest. Um, and this makes a bit of sense, like, for example, in a graph, we've seen with the Yoke Needle Lemma that you can basically think of the edges in the graph as arrows into the graph from this single edge graph, or the vertices being arrows from a single vertex graph, and so on. Um, so this makes quite a lot of sense, but the the beauty of this idea is that we can get quite a few results which look pretty much the same as set theory results, um, which would be talking about ordinary elements and they'd be saying things like, well, if a set has an element of such and such, then it has to have an element of such and such. And that means it's, uh, that means we have this certain thing going on well, we can basically say very similar kind of results and statements about generalized elements. And it helps one to see parallels between set theory and general category theory. So this is nice. So yes, a generalized element of B is simply an arrow into B. If say that arrow X comes from an object T, sometimes we call X a T element of B. So this is just another way of saying that you have an arrow from T to B. Um, 
Okay then, so the first results, this one here, basically says that an arrow is characterized by how it operates on the generalized elements of its source. So more precisely, let's say we have some parallel arrows, F and G, both going from object A to object B in a general category. How do we know if F and G are equal? How do we know if they're the same arrow? Well, this result claims that F and G are equal if and only if composing F with X gives the same result as composing G with X for any generalized element X of A. So in other words, F and G are going to be the same precisely when they give the same result when you compose them with anything coming into A. So hopefully you can see that this is quite similar to a result we know that happens in the category of sets. In particular, this idea of when two functions are the same. Okay, two functions are the same when they operate exactly the same way whenever you give them a particular element as an input. And this basically says that a similar result holds in general categories, but when you consider generalized elements, okay? How do we prove this? Well, the proof's really quite straightforward. Um, when F is equal to G, clearly, we're going to have this result holding because F and G are just the same arrow. So, of course, composing them with any X gives the same result. How do we go from this result here to this result here? Well, it's um, a lot easier than it looks, actually. It's remarkably easy. All we do is we just say, well, this result's supposed to hold for any arrow x from any t to a. So let's consider the special case where t is equal to a and x is equal to the identity of a. And then this says that f after id equals g after id, which means f equals g. Nice and straightforward. Okay, so we have this idea then of generalized elements. What can we do with it? Well, we can use it to organize our thinking about these different special kind of arrows, for one thing. So what about this idea of this arrow F being monic? Well, another way we can express this idea now is to say that this arrow F is monic or monomorphism, if you like. It's monic if and only if this arrow F is one-to-one -one on generalized elements. And when we say that, we just mean exactly this definition. But if you read this definition of being monic again in this context, it makes a bit more sense. OK, so we're really saying that F is one-to-one -one on generalized elements. That means when we consider any sort of um, object and um, we consider these sort of T elements X and Y of A we'll have that F is one-to-one -one on such T elements in the sense that F after X equals F after Y implies X equals Y so F is monic when for any T, F is one-to-one -one on these T elements. It only sends, the only time it sends um, two of these T elements, X and Y, to the same thing is when they were already the same, okay? Um, okay, so that's one thing. This is the idea of something being sort of one-to-one -one on generalized elements. So, okay, this idea of being monic, we can think of now as being one-to-one -one on generalized elements. So, 
What's the kind of other idea that this suggests? Well, it suggests the idea of something being onto on generalised elements. So this kind of conjures up the idea of sort of covering the target's object. With, so this sort of conjures up the idea of our arrow in some sense covering the target object. So you might think, okay, this must be the idea of an epimorphism. But in fact, when we say that an arrow F is, but in fact, when we say that an arrow F is onto for generalized elements, we actually mean something a bit stronger than the notion of an epimorphism. It's this idea here, which we call a split epimorphism or a split epic, okay? Um, now, this is equivalent to the idea of an epic in the category of sets, but there are other cases where this is actually a more kind of constrained um, concept. So I think the best way for me to describe a split epic is to say that this arrow F from A to B in a general category is a split epic um, if and only if for any T and for any T element Y of B there exists a T element X of A such that F after X equals Y. Now this makes a lot of sense, right? Because this is again, very similar to the definition of an onto map, but we're just thinking about arrows coming out of any object rather than necessarily um, sort of points in a set. So basically, we can think that an arrow F is split epic when given any arrow y coming out of any t um, going to the sort of target of our f there's going to be something that we can use to go out of t into the source of our f such that if we do f after that we get our y back okay so we can basically emulate any y with some x So the way I like to think of this is to say that this, so the way I like to think of this is to think that this F is covering so much of this object B with stuff from A that basically for any kind of feature Y of B, there's going to be some feature X of A which F sends uh, onto that Y, okay? It's a bit fuzzy, but it helps me to remember that basically a split epic is something that is covering a lot of the target object. Okay. Um, now, there's an equivalent way uh, to think about what a split epic is. I'll prove this momentarily. But an equivalent way to think about a split epic is this F from A to B is a split epic if and only if there exists an arrow S going the other way, so an arrow S from B to A, which is such that F after S is the identity of B. Okay, so this is gonna be an arrow like this. And doing F after this S gives the identity of B. And this S has a special name. It's called a section of F, okay? So another way we could say this is, is that F is a split epic if and only if it has a section, where a section is a arrow S satisfying this condition here. A section is sometimes called a right inverse, okay? Because it 
it goes on the right and um, these two compose together to give an identity. So why is this called a section and what's it look like? Well, here's a picture in the category of sets of a split epic. See, it's covering this set B. Um, and so what's a section look like? Well, if we line up the elements um, above where they get sent under F, I mean, these are sometimes called fibers, okay? So you might call this the fiber of F over this element of B here and so on. And um, people like to draw kind of parallels between this kind of picture and this way of thinking and uh, the idea of plants and things like that, okay? So if you imagine these are kind of like um, stalks growing over these places and one thing you can do if you have a load of um, plants growing is you can slice them okay you can sort of section them um, and so if we do this kind of idea we can imagine sort of cutting across here so that we pick just one element of each of these fibers and that actually defines for us a section okay so we can then think about our map s being defined like this and you see that this has a property that if we do s and then we do f we get the identity of b so that's where this terminology of the idea of sections comes from and this idea of sections is really quite a deep idea um, it has quite a lot to do with things like slice categories that I'm not going to get into at the moment okay so we have these two interesting ways to look at what a split epic is one of them is simply the existence of a right inverse a section that if we do followed by the arrow itself we get the identity. And this other way of looking at a split epic is to say that for any arrow Y, we can find some arrow X such that if we do our split epic F after X, we get Y. But how can we see that these two different ways of looking at a split epic are equivalent? Let's assume this first one written in red, okay? So we have that for any y, there exists an x such that fx equals y. So why don't we pick y is equal to the identity of b? So we'll pick our t to be b and we'll pick our y to be idb. Well, in that case, this claims that there exists an x such that idb equals f after x. Well, let's call that x s, and it's our section, okay? So we have that f after s equals idb, and that's what we want. So we've now taken this red statement and shown it implies this yellow statement. Okay, so now we want to go the other way around. So let's assume this yellow statement now, we'll assume that there exists this section. So we have this kind of situation where F after S is IDB. And we want to prove that this kind of thing holds. So let's suppose that we have some object T with some arrow Y from T to B. And now we want to show that there exists an X from T to B such that F after X equals Y. Well, why don't we define x equals s after y? Why are we doing this? Well, let's consider now what f after x is going to be. So now f after x 
is going to be f after s after y, which is going to be y. So we've proved that this result in red holds, okay? Because for any y from t to b, we've shown how to construct an x such that f x equals y. So we're done. So, okay, we have these two different ways to look at what a split epic is. Now, I also said that a split epic is a special kind of epic. So, how can we see that? Well, let's suppose that this arrow f from a to b is a split epic. Well, that means it has to have a section. So, let's call it section s. So, we have f after s is idb. Now, how do we show that this f is an epic? We know it's a split epic by assumption, but how do we show that it's an epic? Well, the usual way. We'll assume we have some parallel arrows, u and v, coming out of b. And we're going to assume that u after f equals v after f. And we want to show that u equals v. So how are we going to do it? Well, we're just going to compose on the right with our sections and that's going to get rid of these f's and get what we want so if we do these things after s we get u after f after s equals v after f after s and then these two things cancel because s is a section we have this and these two things cancel we get u equals v so we have that u after f equals v after f implies u. We have u after f equals v after f implies u equals v. So f is a split epic. So f must be an epic. Okay. So this argument shows then that every split epic is an epic. Um, but what about the other way around? Is it true that every epic is a split epic? Well, no. I mean, that's why we have different terminology for these things. However, that is true in the category of sets. In the category of sets, at least with the traditional axioms, every epic is also a split epic. Um, but in fact, this has been quite a, um, a point of interest and um, arguments amongst mathematicians in some sense um, because basically that's the axiom of choice okay so um, a few years ago now um, Bill Levere um, found out an amazing way to basically um, describe set theory as in describe the category of sets axiomatically from sort of a category theory um, viewpoint. Okay, so the usual way we do set theory is we build it up with um, Zermano-Franco axioms or whatever. Um, we sort of build up set theory from inside. Um, but what Levere did is he said, well, if you have a category and it has these different things, if it has um, natural number objects, if it has sub-object classifier, blah, 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 etc., various different things, then it looks just like the category of sets. Okay, so this is a very interesting kind of alternative way to um, define what set theory is about. And when you come at it from that angle, um, you see that some of these kind of axioms that we use in set theory um, basically can be expressed in a sort of category theory way, in the language of category theory. And it turns out that the axiom of choice um, corresponds to this kind of claim that every epic is a split epic because it's saying something 
um, I mean this is a bit fuzzy but roughly speaking it's saying something like when you're covering your target you can pick members of your source in order to make one of these sections okay um, you can see that this is sort of related to the axiom of choice so um, the claim that every epic is a split epic corresponds to the axiom of choice it's what category theorists call the axiom of choice and that's not true in general categories but it is true in the category of sets um, as is traditionally imagined okay so recall that an epic is the kind of dual to the idea of a monic so then what's the dual to the idea of a split epic well the answer is what's called a split monic and it is like i say basically just the notion of a split epic but dualized so it has many of the same kind of properties just sort of with all the arrows going in the opposite direction so we can think of a split monic as an arrow f from a to b such that there exists an arrow r going from b to a with the property that doing this r after this f gives us the identity of a so um this is really a sort of um, extra strong version of a monic if you like or a special kind of monic so um, I mean this R here is sometimes called a retraction or we can think of it as a sort of left inverse because it's the kind of thing that if we compose it on the left of our F we get the identity and um, you can see what these kind of retractions look like in set from this picture here so there are similar results about split monics as there are about split epics for example it's true that every split monic is a monic um, now I think in set monics and split monics are just the same kind of arrows Okay, so one of the nice things about knowing about all these different kinds of arrows is we can see more sort of parallels between what's going on in general category theory and what's going on in set theory. So, for example, two sets in the category of sets are going to be isomorphic precisely when there's a one-to-one -one onto mapping between those two sets, okay? Um, now it turns out that two objects A and B uh, in a category in general for two such objects an arrow F is going to be an isomorphism from A to B or iso as we call it precisely when F is one-to-one -one on generalized elements in other words when F is monic and when f is onto on generalized elements in other words when f is split epic so f is iso if and only if it's monic and split epic so how can we see this well let's start by supposing that f is iso now i've already shown that if f is iso then f is monic so i also have to show that if f is iso then f is split epic that's pretty easy because if f is iso what's that mean it means there's this inverse arrow f to the minus one and you see that this is also a right inverse in other words f to the minus one is a section of f because it's something that if we compose it on the right we get the identity so if f is iso these two equations hold and this one implies that we have a section of f so f must be split epic so okay we know that this statement implies this statement but how can we go the other way around this is a bit more interesting okay so let's now suppose that f is monic and f is split epic well the fact that f is split epic means that there exists this arrow s 
from B to A, which is such that F after S is the identity arrow of B. So wouldn't it be nice if S was actually equal to the inverse of F? In other words, wouldn't it be nice if S after F, so it's like this, um, was the identity of A? Is it? Is that true? Yes, that is true. How are we going to show it? Well, there's an interesting kind of trick to this. So think about this arrow F. There's a few ways to write this arrow F. One of them is as F after the identity arrow of A. That's fine. We could also write it as the identity arrow of B after F. But we know that the identity arrow of B is F after S, because S is this section here. So we can replace that identity B with F after S. So we get that F after IDA equals F after S after F. Now, we recall that F is monic. Okay, so the fact that this equals this means that this equals this, and that's what we wanted. So, so we're done. We have um, the F after S is IDB, and S after F is IDA. So F must be an isomorphism. So it's interesting then that F being one-to-one -one on generalized elements and onto on generalized elements is equivalent to saying that F is an isomorphism. And it's kind of reinforcing this idea that if we have an arrow, if we really want to know what it is, it suffices to know how it composes with other arrows. So I should just mention without proof that there is also a dual to this result, which is to say that F is iso if and only if F is epic and F is split monic. Okay, so epic is the dual idea to monic and split monic is the dual idea to split epic okay so the proof to that would be very similar just with the arrows going the opposite way around basically okay then so let me try and summarize most of the results i've been talking about with this venn diagram here so the main kind of arrows we've been studying are monics and then the dual idea is epics and then there's this special kind of monics called split monics. The dual of that idea is the idea of split epics. And then we also have these isomorphisms here. So these kind of bubbles are illustrating sets of maps. And we're thinking about this happening in a general category. In a particular category, things can be kind of simpler. Uh, for example, in the category of sets, the epics and the split epics are the same. And so on but this is the case in general all right we have these kind of five different families of arrows and set theoretically they're sort of associated like this so um, these are the monics here and usually we will find that there are some arrows which are epics and monics at the same time now in the category of sets everything that's an epic and a monic is an iso but that doesn't have to be so in general, okay? There are categories where you have arrows which are epic and monic, but not iso. Um, and then a special kind of monic is this so-called split monic, so that's contained, so the split monics are contained in the monics. Similarly, the split epics are contained in the epics. But we have this result which says that if an arrow is onto on generalized elements, in other words, if it's a split epic, and if it's one-to-one -one on general, generalized elements, in other words, it's monic, then it's iso, and vice versa, if it's iso, then it's split epic and it's monic. So the isomorphisms 
constitute the intersection of the split ethics and the monics, or dually, the isos constitute the intersection of the split monics and the epics. So these maps here, which are simultaneously split monics and epics, are the same as these maps, which are simultaneously split epics and monics, and these are the isos. Okay, so this is the kind of general structure of how these special kind of arrows form these different sorts of subsets inside a category. And then, of course, you'll usually have many arrows outside of these bubbles, which are not monics or epics. OK, so I also want to say something about what these monics and epics look like in some of my favourite kinds of categories, which are categories of functors from some category C to set. So I really like these kind of categories because they are toposes and we can kind of get our hands on them. And there's lots of interesting examples like the category of dynamical systems and the category of graphs. And it turns out that the form of these monics and epics in this kind of case are really quite straightforward. Um, so basically, if we understand what monics and epics look like in the category of sets, as we do, then um, it's pretty easy to understand what they look like in these kind of cases. So this is a result from, I think it's page 20 of um, Reyes et al's book, Generic Figures and Their Gluings. Um, and it goes like this. Suppose we have a couple of objects, G and G dash, in this category of functors from C to set. And let's suppose that alpha is a natural transformation from G to G dash. In other words, alpha is a kind of arrow from this functor to this functor in set to the power of C. So then the claim is that alpha is going to be mono, it's going to be a monomorphism, if and only if each of its components, like say the ETH component associated with any object E of C, um, is going to be a one-to-one -one function, okay? So basically what this is saying is that the monics in this category are those arrows that have each of their components looking like a one-to-one -one function, okay? And in a similar way, um, the claim is that alpha will be an epic um, precisely when each of its components looks like an onto function. Okay, so this is really quite intuitive. And it means that the structure of monics and epics in these categories of functors into sets are really quite simple. Now, I should just say, um, I haven't exactly proved this result. Um, I think I know how to prove the first bit using the Yoni dilemma. Um, for the second bit, I have a rough idea how to prove it. I think um, one can probably um, one can probably express an epic in terms of a push out, and then a push out is a co limit, and co limits in set to the power of c look, work pretty much like they do in set. So I can imagine how this second statement's true, but I should say I haven't actually proved it. So. I don't like just uh, quoting other authors' work without having seen the proof myself. So, you know, I can't 100% vouch that this second result's correct, but maybe someone else can um, find a proof and write it in the comments or something. Um, anyway, so these give us characterizations of monics and epics in this category set to the power of C. And it turns out also that this category, set to the power of C, is an example of a topos. And there is also a more general result, which is that in any topos, we have that if an arrow is epic and it's monic, then it's iso. OK, so in a topos, when something ticks these boxes and these boxes, it is an iso. OK, so... Um, Basically, we see that the isomorphisms in this category set to the power of C 
are precisely those kind of natural transformations that have each of their components as a bijection, a one-to-one -one onto mapping. 